Hi, everybody. Uh, happy Mother's Day. Thanks for spending it with us. Thanks for everybody who came to the workshop earlier. So this is, this is uh, quite an honor to be able to introduce this next panel. Uh, my name is Shane Michael Singh. I'm the executive editor of Playboy Magazine. Uh, for my, my fan base is over here. So, <laughs> um, so how do you introduce uh, Erica Zhang and Molly Zhang Fast? Um, they're both incredibly successful, prominent female writers, but the worlds in which they achieve their success are incredibly different, right? Um, Erica Zhang was a prominent major voice in second wave feminism. Molly Zhang Fast, um, I'm not going to, uh, you know, prescribe a type of feminism to Molly, but if you were to read her columns and op-eds on Ivanka Trump, you would understand her perspective and um, the different way in which she approaches the role of a woman in public life, and, and that's really fascinating. Um, I would like to start this conversation a little bit with uh, something that Erica actually wrote um, for us in, uh, I'm not, actually, I'm not, I'm not gonna tell you what year it was, because it's, it's more fascinating this way, but Erica wrote this for us. Uh, through, is Molly here? Molly, Molly Oswalk? Molly, right there, there you go. So Molly did this interview with Erica, and this is what she told Playboy. What is fascinating to me is that there's a nutty minority that wants to take back all the rights of women. A woman who can't control her own fertility can't control anything about her life. It's the bedrock of woman's freedom. These guys who are passing crazy laws about sticking sonogram wands up women's vaginas know the laws will be overturned. They're taking a stand for the benefit of the fringe minority that votes in midterm elections. The majority doesn't agree with them, so what we're seeing is democracy being perverted for the sake of a well-organized fringe. It's interesting to watch and distressing. If you go back in time, Hitler didn't have a majority when he came to Munich. He did not have a majority, but a very well-organized minority can come to power in a democracy. Watching it happen is truly amazing. One thing you can see is that fascists always want to keep women barefoot and pregnant. And what is it about? It's about fear women, fear women's immense physical power, the power to give birth, and if they can't stop it, they want to control it. Women are mysterious objects. Uh, Erica did this in 2014, all right, which is, which is incredible when uh, we, were, we still have President Barack Obama, right? Um, so, and I also, I don't like reading from, uh, from my phone, but I have to say this because uh, it just, I, I, I told them that I would say it. So to lend my perspective, uh, Playboy's been able to achieve and maintain multi-generational appeal because our core values are timeless. We believe in equality, sexual freedom, freedom of speech, and a culture in which everybody can pursue pleasure. Those values were inherent to the brand when Erica Zhang sat for the Playboy interview in September 1975 and are what drove us to today to invite her daughter, who writes op-eds on being a liberal woman in the age of Trump's presidency, here to speak with us and her mother today. So we are proud to offer this forum to this amazing mother-daughter duo on Mother's Day, and I hope you guys enjoy the conversation. Hi. Hi. Hello. Thank you so much for having us. Um, I'm always it's a pleasure to be here. I'm always excited to interview my mom. <laughs> She was like, before when we were backstage, she's like, don't cut me off. <laughs> and I was like, I never would do that. Um, I hope I'm woke enough. I, what I wanted to say. I that, think I am, but. I, I, what I, we want, we were to, I wanted to, my first question is that incredible quote. How, how do you know, mom? I think a writer is someone who lives like a wound that never heals. And if you're a writer, you feel the rumblings in the air. And smack in the middle of the Obama administration when we were so thrilled, we thought everything has changed. We'll never go back. We'll never go back to that old world. But I began to see people overturning women's freedom to control their own bodies. And I thought, that's where it starts. It always starts with that. First they put crazy headdresses on women or veils on their faces. And then they try to eliminate women's ability to control their bodies. And then before you know it, they're wearing burqas. Did you think that Trumpism, well, there, those are two different things, but let's just stick to Trumpism here. So did you think that Trumpism uh, was going, 
like, did you think Trumpism was going to happen? Did you think Trump was going to win? Like, I know in 2014, I did not think that Trump I'd, would be I thought he was a joke. Yeah. But I knew that people thought Hitler was a joke, too. Right. And there were certain people who supported him because they thought they could get rich. And that's repeating itself, by the way. And when people think they can get rich, the bodies of women are the first thing that go. Can you talk about how, what it was like when you did the Playboy interview in 1975? Because we were just talking about this interview. And um, in 1975, I was negative three. <laughs> OK? So I, and I was reading some of these interviews, and I've read them before. And I, I mean, we were talking about them earlier, and they're like 10,000 words, which is like a book. I mean, I live in yes. the world of Twitter. Like 280 characters seems like a lot to me. So I was like, 10,000 words, how do you even do that? And, um, but I wanted to know, in 1975, you sat for your Playboy interview. And will you just talk a little bit about like, where you were in 1975, what was happening, and also Playboy in 1975? I'm curious about that, too. I was, I was living in Malibu, on old Malibu Road, with your father. We weren't married. You weren't conceived yeah. yet. Yeah. And we used to debate, can we have a child in Malibu? They all become drug addicts. Which I, <laughs> I managed to become a drug addict in New York. OK. But, I was and we the were, good news. We yes. were very concerned about that, because we would look out at the beach at all these stone kids, and we'd say, well, if we decide we want a baby, should we go back east? I mean, that was the kind of, but what the atmosphere was bad, like was that we felt we'd never go back to the bad old days. Now, of course, my old friend Margaret Atwood was already writing The Handmaid's Tale. And I could see whisperings of fascism coming back, because that's what writers do. But even in 1975? Because of the, I wrote a book that gave women the right to their own pleasure. Fear of Flying came out in 1973. Right. right. And people got so mad. I mean, now women come up to me and say, thank you for my sex life. Oh, yeah. In those days, I was pilloried. It was like I was a witch being burnt at the stake. Not so much in Europe, but in the United States. Um, can you? And the interviewer, by the way, was a woman who, who worked interviewed for Play you? Playboy. Um, her name has gone out of my head. But I do want to say there are a lot of women who worked for Playboy boy then and now. There was a lot of anti, yay for all of <laughs> um, There were a lot of anti-sex feminists. And my position always was. Was that more true in the 70s? Yes. Choose wisely. Choose a man who respects you. Choose a man who respects your pleasure. That was not a popular view. Um, I, I, so we were talking about anti-sex feminism, and I wanted to get back to it. I, I think, and I could be wrong, um, that there's that the right has sort of, for the largely claimed the anti-sex uh, mantle, in this totally right, and that what that sort of anti-sex feminism is largely not as much of a thing as it was in the '70s. But we were talking about this because you were good friends with Andrea Dworkin who had this very interesting experience. You know, she wrote a lot about the culture, this sort of, can you talk culture about that a little bit? Of, of rape. I, you know, I didn't agree with her, but her vulnerability made me feel protective towards her. She was such a fragile creature. But a very smart feminist. Very yeah. smart, and she had been raped. And there, I think, but I and think, I think that had changed her whole but, view of sex. Right, but I think there are, we don't want to, you know, we want to sort of stay in yeah. there. There are mm -hmm. many things we don't want to confabulate here. But um, uh, let's talk about the pill. Can we talk about the pill yeah, a little sure. bit and birth control? Because I think so much of sexual liberation is about this birth control stuff and why it's so important that we are. Do you want to, can you talk a little bit about what it was like in, the, in 1973? About what? For, about birth, birth control, control and sexuality and... Well, you know that I grew up in a feminist home. My grandmother was of the suffrage generation. She only went to women doctors. Uh, my mother was, a, was an artist who was a passionate feminist. She used to walk us around the art museums of Europe and say, this was painted by a woman. Don't forget <laughs> it. This was painted by a woman. 
don't forget it. That was grandma. Right. Or as your kids called her, scary grandma. Well, only one of my kids. She was a little scary at the end. But that does not undermine the feminism. Continue. Yeah. So I, thought fe I took feminism for granted my whole life. And I was just amazed. I already had a diaphragm when the pill came out. I didn't want to mess with the chemicals in my body. But you, it, was a, it was an important moment. It was an important moment, women. and I spoke on TV about it. And I remember warning women not to let chemicals muck up their bodies, and that there but it's were very, it's many forms a very, of it's, birth control but it's that a you could have. Right. It's largely known as very safe contraceptives. Yeah. Important well, now it is, as, because the hormones are lower. Um, can we talk about the heartbeat? Bill, that's something I want to talk about is the heartbeat bill in Atlanta. Yes. Uh, I mean, in Georgia. So with this, you know, there are all of these, um, there are a couple states that are like trying to chip away at Roe. And um, they know now that they have these two conservative justices, they have Gorsuch and they have Kavanaugh, that they can, they can overturn Roe. And I think they're quietly trying, I'm working on a piece about this for Glamour right now, but I, that they're qui quietly trying to sort of dig away at our rights. And the heartbeat bill, I mean, Mississippi, you know, and then now in Georgia. And so I w I'm curious to know what you think about this. And, and again, the heartbeat bill is that you can't have an abortion after six weeks when they can see a heartbeat because then it's, you know, you're not allowed to have it anymore. And the viability for Roe is 24 weeks. So it's like this, and, and as you know, and AOC talk, uh, tweeted about this, and I thought this was exactly right, you know, a lot, most women don't know they're pregnant at six weeks. Absolutely. Because so, that's two we being two weeks late for a period. You don't even know you're pregnant. And many people have a spontaneous abortion if the pregnancy doesn't hold. And women could be theoretically thrown into jail but, for a spontaneous but abortion. But you lived before, you uh, theoretically. I mean, we're not there yet. But uh, you lived through Roe. Ro. Yes. Can you talk a little bit about that? Well, you know, a lot of people like. How are, old were you during I that? I can't home? remember. <laughs> I, I really can't remember. I should know that, too. All right, but, we're both. Yeah. But I have to say, Roe was based on privacy. Many legal scholars believe it should have had a better grounding, and that privacy was perhaps not the greatest thing to put in on, but that was all we could have at the time. And I will say that it's clear that fascists always handcuff women first. You know who they are. They start telling you what headdresses to wear. Well, the Brian, Watch Kemp, out. The Brian Kemp thing is, you know, he's, I mean, there, there's a, there's a school of thought that Stacey Abrams really should have won that, yeah. right? And she, and she really did register a lot of voters, and she really, you know, and there were a lot of polls that were closed early, and there were a lot of things that were set up in a way so that she couldn't win, um, <clears throat> and then he goes and signs the heartbeat bell. So you really right. do see that elections really matter. Elections and, really matter. And that voter just, and you know, the and the way that... gerrymandering that has been done. Look, let's face it, the GOP is a minority party which stays in power through gerrymandering and suppressing votes. Right. And that is so anti-American. Right. It's terrifying that people can go suppressing the votes of African Americans. Right. And particularly women. And African American women have been the core of the Democratic Party for so many years. And they've saved our bacon yeah. So many times. Bye bye, <laughs> That's what? right. Bye bye, Roy Moore. That's right. Oh, what God. happened that I have to say But they've that been the heartbeat. Talk about I, a heartbeat. They've been the heartbeat of the I Democratic have to say Party. that Roy Moore that I made me cry. I mean that was so amazing. And Doug and Doug Jones is amazing. I mean, I he's a, actually a great speaker. Um yeah, we're lucky to have him. So uh I wanted to I wanted to ask you a few more questions about like what do you think you told me this really interesting story a long time ago about going on tour as a woman, like during the 70s, and how you wouldn't eat in the restaurant by yourself. Right. Do you remember that? Yes. Can you talk about that a little bit? Because it, when you told me the story, I like couldn't even imagine. And remember, right. I'm 40, so it's not like, you know, I came of age in a time that was still not 
you know, people were still kind, you know, men still did stuff that they probably wouldn't do today that was, you know, a little bit dicey. But um, you talk about that, you talked about not being able to um, eat, to eat by yourself. Can you just talk about that a little bit? Yeah, because men would come on to me. And I always ordered room service in the hotel room and watched television. And I, I have never been abused in that way. I had a grandfather who loved me and a father who right, adored me. Right, but that me. doesn't have anything to do with being no, abused. No, but I knew that I could easily be abused. But I think, I think. I okay. knew it. Right. Why, how did I know it? I'm not sure. But you were careful about. I was you were very uh, careful. scared to eat by yourself. You also told me a long time ago that you felt like when you were a woman alone in a hotel, men would, would like it, you didn't have you felt scared for your own well-being. They made an assumption that a woman alone was available. Yeah. And I, I think that still happens in many parts of the world. Clearly. I think that it's just like that idea of safety is so, you know, that we can be safe in our environment and not have people try to take advantage of us is so, so important. So, so important and really. And scary. now that I have your beautiful daughter, Bet. Yeah, I have a daughter. At, she's 11, and I think about it all the time. I thought about it for myself, but now I have this granddaughter, and, you know, it's. It's terrifying. So do you think that um, Roe will stay, or do you think that they'll be able to overturn Roe? I'm just curious. I think they're going to do their damnedest to overturn Ray, Roe. And there are certain legal problems with Lo Roe that it's based on privacy. We still don't have the Equal Rights Amendment. We have one state to go. Ruth Bader Ginsburg was asked once, how many women should be on the Supreme Court? She said, I think nine. <laughs> <laughs> and I think we need to have nine women for a while, and we're going the other way. We need the Equal Rights Amendment, yeah. and we need women on the Supreme Court, and we are not going in that direction. Well, I don't, and, and I don't agree. Because quite terrifying. We, I, I do work, some political work. You and do a lot of political and we've, work. And um, we've put a lot of pretty incredible women in Congress, including the youngest African-American woman Laura, in Congress, Lauren Underwood, Underwood, who's Underwood, one of my yeah. favorite people and who's a nurse, who, who's like a public, health, a public health genius. And so I think there are a lot of exciting. And you know what's funny is But during, on the court, we don't have enough. No, we definitely don't. No, and we, we really have this don't. scary president, and that's why we need to win the Senate back. Um, but I, I um, when we were going through this pre-midterm stuff and we were helping these women running for office, I wasn't, these women were a lot more impressive than the men. Like, it, you know, like the white guys weren't so great, but we had like these women who were like nurses and doctors and had been, you know, it, veterans. And, you know, it was just sort of fascinating that we, that they were like really great, can you know, they were actually just better candidates. I remember at a fundraiser I went to with you where Hillary came to introduce the arena Democrat. Lauren said to me, I was a nurse, but I figured I could do more in Congress. Yeah, I mean, she... I mean, she said, a, if I want to change the world, it shouldn't was, be one person at a time, I should be in Congress. But she also worked in the Obama administration doing public health. And what's interesting to me is uh, uh, women need to be told to run for office, like, about 20 times more than a man. You know, you have to constantly tell a woman right. to run for office, whereas a man just assumes he should run for office. And um, <laughs> uh, it's just fascinating to me. So I, it's very, I mean, I think it's a terrible, terrifying time, but I also think it's a very exciting time. It is. For women very. candidates. Like, we have some great, amazing women out we've there. We've got to be there in the corridors of power. And we've got to make a difference. And more and more, because we have such weird people in Washington now. I mean, we have a president who won't obey the Constitution for starters, and who wants to be president for life, and who meets with Putin in public, and throws out the American press. Um, will you talk a little bit about what you think women can do to um, support other women and enact change? Yeah. I think it's so important. When I was a young woman writer, I was pilloried by other women writers, and I made a promise to myself that I would do everything I could to help young women, because I really believe that mentoring is feminism. And feminism is mentoring. 
And today I met Molly for lunch at the hotel we're staying at. And she was with a friend I'd never met before. And he said, thank you so much for helping my former wife when she published a first novel and she was getting pilloried from everywhere. And I was thrilled that he remembered. Yeah. I and thought, and that talk? has been my way of dealing with my own experience. Yeah, that's really interesting. Um, should we go to a Q&A? Do people have questions? Interesting. Fabulous we have a questions. little, probably we have a little more time. About politics and the, and birth And control writing, and I mean. pro-sex feminism and writing. I feel like my job as a writer is to inspire people. I'm here to inspire. I mean, that's what writers are supposed to do. Okay, we have a question. How do you um, recommend speaking to, with people that don't agree with you? Because I think everything you're saying, you're, you're, you're reaching the audience that completely agrees with you and we're doing all we can. Yeah. So how do you speak to the other people? I try to suppress <laughs> my the anger. press is probably not so good. <laughs> I try not to say, fuck you, you're an idiot. <laughs> and, and I try very hard to be patient. Um, but one of the things about the right fringe right now, and they are a fringe, even though they have this insane president in the White House, they don't read anything. They don't know history. You mention things that happened in the past, and they don't know. So they're hard to deal with. I watched Donnie Deutsch yesterday on MSNBC, and he said what Democrats should do is speak to the issues that people feel in their gut, which is taking away health care for pre-existing conditions, um, taking away birth control. Taking, we should not talk theoretically. And we should also talk about the fact that all the tax cuts were made for billionaires. Well, and also the tax cuts were, I mean, the thing that gets me crazy is that the tax cuts were set up to punish blue states right. by not making the salt, the state taxes deductible. Right. So it was set up as a way, you know, if you have high state taxes, your taxes went up. So California and New York had taxes go up because they're blue states. Absolutely. Which is fascinating. And they're going to do all these really tricky things that are unconstitutional. Like Trump has just said, I don't care about subpoenas. Send me all the subpoenas you want. But That's I so anti-constitutional. It's unbelievable. And what gives me nightmares a night is him being president for life. I don't which think he's be he president. wants. But I but I know. do think it's important. I mean, I'm someone who does interact with a lot of people who aren't who don't necessarily agree with me and who are conservatives. And I do think it's important. I mean, I actually think that Democrats going on Fox News has been good, largely. I mean, I hate Fox News with a burning passion, <laughs> and like eighty percent of my time on Twitter is spent trolling Fox News. And Tucker Carlson even told, said I wasn't very smart the other day on Fox News. I was like, yes. <laughs> I was like, oh, you don't like me, Tucker? I was like, good. Uh, I'm doing something right. And, but, um, but I also think, like, it's not, you know, when Bernie Sanders went on there and did a town hall, it was pretty good. And, like, they were cheering. And, you know, we have a lot of, I mean, I, 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 write, I will support whoever the nominee is. And I, I mean, right now I'm very involved with Mayor Pete, but, like, I am very I will support I know, whoever the nominee but I is. pledge to support whoever the nominee is because what's important is getting rid of Trump. But um, I think there's a place for getting rid for um, for speaking to speaking to the Fox News audience. Like those people are not seeing us because they're seeing Fox News, and that's a lot of people. Like Tucker Carlson gets like five million people. Now, I mean, the people who contacted me were all like work for Media Matters and like it's their job to watch Tucker Carlson. But, um, you know, and they were like, oh my God, you're on Tucker Carlson. But, um, you know, and I've had other friends. I mean, I'm friends with a lot of the GOP Never Trumpers and like some of their stuff I, I think is very dicey. Like I would not, you know, I, I write for them because I think there are some smart Republicans that we've lost and we need to mm -hmm. get those people back and they need to vote for Democrats. But, um, you know, they are some of how we got here, you know. They're, and uh, so I think, but I think it's important for them, you know, if they're patriotic, they can't support Trump. If you believe in democracy, you cannot support Trump. 
you can't. Like, it's binary. So I think it'll be, um, you know, they're going to have to make a decision. They may not be pro-choice, but at the end of the day, they're going to have to vote for, you know, democracy and not for dictatorship. That's and so great, Molly. That's what it's going to be. I'm up, I really proud of her. <laughs> you may have noticed. Um, I come from a family of very strong women, and she's the Wait. strongest. Yeah. Yes. yes. So you mentioned your granddaughter, your daughter. Yeah. You're raising a young, powerful feminist. How do you do that if it's not a woman? Maybe it's two young white males. Yes. Oh, she has two the... white males that you she's do. raising. Yes, I do have two white males. So how... <laughs> You've got three kids. I've got three kids. I have oh. a 15-year-old who I had when I was 24. Wow. I got pregnant by accident, kept the baby, as I was going to. But I... I wrote an article for the Wall Street Journal, an op-ed about how like, I got pregnant by accident, but I carried this rare Jewish genetic disease. And I, the doctor said I might have to have an abortion, but it would be a second trimester abortion. And I wrote this piece about how like, I was so grateful that I got to keep my baby, and that it was fine, and that it was OK. And people were like, she's a baby killing harpy. And I was, <laughs> I was on the cover of like, pro-life news. I was like, evil baby killer. And I was like, you guys, I didn't even have an abortion in the piece. But yes, sorry, go on. I didn't mean so to. Hi, Jack. Um, the question is, what are the things at these ages, like under 11, that we can be doing to help um, kids, not just maybe young white males, yes. but just kids in general, really learn about feminism and racism in a way that's like not so terrifying? Yes. Mm -hmm. um, like maybe three things that we can do. So I would so say. This, this is a very good question. I think about this a lot. I have these sons. In fact, when Trump won, I was like, because I was like, this isn't going to happen. Like, I would say to my husband every night, like, he's not going to win. And he would say, no, Sam Wang, this, doc, this very smart guy on TV, um, he says that Trump is not going to win. And he says if Trump wins, it's statistically impossible. And if he wins, he's going to eat a bug on TV. So. Sam Wang ended up eating a bug on TV, <laughs> needless to say. He works at Princeton. He's like this brilliant, brilliant guy. But he was wrong, as we were all wrong. So the next day, my son, who's 13, who was 13 at the time, looked at me, and he's like, um, are we going to be OK? And I was like, you're a man. Like, I was like, nobody is going to prevent you like, you're from having an abortion or taking birth control. Like, I was like, you I think it's so important for the, the and I think about this for myself, too, like, to have um, with my kids, I'm always like, I'm always like, you are so privileged. Like in certain ways, I, I do a lot of work with Arena, and so I meet all these activists. And like, you know, I met this activist the other day at this Planned Parenthood thing who was homeless, worked at a gas station, and um, during that time, she got such good grades that she w goes to Columbia now. Like I was like. I said to my son, I was like, you're not allowed to complain. Like, these people are, like, killing themselves and, like, doing these incredible things. And if you look at Arizona... What about teaching boys to respect women? Right. Well, okay, and so... And to respect women's pleasure and women's well, decisions. Well, I don't... Okay, well, they're a little young for pleasure, but I... <laughs> but I, if a woman says no... I think your, my sons, I your mean. Your sons have to know that right. no is no. I mean, I think that is like the very bare minimum. Right. I think that la the larger issue is like, um, you know, I, I'm very honest with my sons about like how, how, how hard it, you know, the world is hard for a lot of people. And it's, and you know, it's harder for women and it's harder for people of color. And it just is. And I hope someday it won't be. But to like ignore that is doing very bad parenting. But they didn't do that, so it's like how. I mean, they need create that empathetic place for them where they don't have to take on the like I'm right. terrible and I had nothing to do with yeah. this because. I, I mean, right. That's I, a really important. That's point, an important actually. point. But I also think that there's like you need, but but I also think there's a sensitivity that needs to be there. You know, with the with my sons, like I. I think that they need to know what they're coming into, like, and that they have, you know, privilege that they're lucky to have, but that also it's like they need to be, like, respectful to women and sensitive to women. And, I mean, I think my sons are, I mean, so I have a 15-year-old and then I have a set of boy-girl twins. 
So the boy twin is like, I hate her. <laughs> and, and, and she's adopted. And she's adopted. He tells her she's adopted. <laughs> um, but that's not sexism. I think that's just being a terrible, sibling terrible rivalry. sibling. Yeah. But I think it's really important. And I think also, like, all this stuff is about talking to kids all the time and reading books and knowing about the news. I mean, we talk a lot in our house about the news, which I think is really helpful for them because they see what's going on. And there's, like, so much injustice. Like, I can't even believe how every day, like, I, I can't believe the level of injustice. Like, and so my kids know about the level of injustice. So, like, I feel like that's very useful with kids. Like. They can see what's going on, and they can see, um, I, I mean, there's so much injustice even in, we live in a blue city in a blue state, and there's so much injustice. And um, so I think they have a pretty good sense. I mean, both my sons want to run for office. So, but the second son wants to serve in the army first. So I was like, oh. <laughs> but yeah, but I was like, but I do think public service, and, and I will say, I know a lot of people don't like this, but I think this idea of public service for a year for kids is actually a really good idea. And I think I would sign my kids. We never talked about this, but I've always believed in it. I think it's, I mean, I don't necessarily like want them to like in go Israel. in the, no, they I don't, no, no, to. not like they do in Israel, not no, the no, army. No, not, in, you don't. It, but I'm like teaching, like Teach for right. America, yeah. Right. Or like right. working on public works projects in America, I think is great. Right. And the army and, uh, that does not get me so excited. Well, I don't want Darwin to go in the army, but whatever, <laughs> whatever he wants. <laughs> yes. Sorry. Uh, this might be a little bit of a tangent, but you spoke about injustice, and then you, we've been speaking about like how you're going to teach a, a ca young Caucasian male. But I think it's really important in how we deliver a message to young females yeah. from yeah. you know eight years old to 22, 30, like it doesn't matter what age, like we have to be able to connect with ourselves and find confidence with our, in ourselves to stand up for the justices we think we deserve. Yes. How would you suggest that we deliver that message to the generations that are coming, coming that are younger than 40? <laughs> <laughs> right. No, I think it's very, I mean, it is so, I mean, I think, like, we have this chance with this younger generation and these young leaders in Congress that I'm very excited about to really say that you are equal. You are equal. You are equal. You are white, you're black, you're a woman, you're a man, you're equal. Like, that's the goal, right, is to have everyone be equal. And so, I mean, I think a lot of that is talk. We, we were actually talking about this before because I think we were talking about women being hard on themselves. Yes, very We're, hard. And um, I even see with my daughter, she's much harder on herself than my son. Right, but how do you, like, with that thought in mind, is like, how do we balance that from, like, the social media aspect? Right. Where we still present so much, we create so much weight in the aesthetic. Right, how right. How help individuals, women in particular, understand that it goes beyond the shell? We try to change the culture. I mean, representation matters. Like, we, we get plus size models, not that that's like even a term I want to use, but like, we get people who look like us on television and in advertising, and we are like, we change the narrative and we do everything differently, you know? And we have, I mean, in some ways, it's much better than when I, you know? Yeah, it, it is better. Because, like, when I came of age during Kate Moss, so, like, I was like, why am I so fat? <laughs> you know, like, right. I, right, Kate Moss. I, I'm a plus size model, so I understand. I love it. And, but yeah, so I came of age, and now, like, I think in some ways it's a little bit less, I mean, Kate Moss was like, she looked like she was going to die. Like, yeah. um, so that, I think it's gotten a little bit better, but yeah, I mean, I think representation is going to be, is the game. Like, getting people in is getting kids to be able to see people who look like them on television is a big deal. And like you see that even with, I mean, it's like the Cosby show. Like the Cosby show was a big deal because it was like that television like looks like us. And so I do think that's going to be the big thing. But also like we have to make a stink. I mean, I was like largely less political. And then when this Trump thing happened, I was like, oh my God, no one is taking care of us. Like we are screwed. Like I need to get, and I get like tons of death threats. And, I'm like honestly good. Like 
fuck you. Like, I'm on the side of angels here. Like, this is what we need to be doing. And, like, we should all be getting done. I mean, we shouldn't all be getting done. That's a joke. But, but you know, Molly, but I'm saying, you like. You deal with it so much but we better should than be, I ever did. She's but, proud of it. Well, I'm not proud of it. But I want, I, yeah. you know, we live in this insane, Trumpy world. And, like, if we don't stop it, no one will. Yeah. Like, and it's going to be, it's on all of us to, like, stop this nightmare. And so I, I'm happy to do it. And I hope nobody actually shows up at my house. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Hi. So great to finally see you in person. Um, this has been so nice. I wanted to ask you. Alyssa Milano has called for a sex strike. <laughs> it's sort of a so. It's like a hashtag Alyssa Strata, yeah. which seems so like tone deaf to the point. And I would love to hear you talk about that for a while. Yeah. Mom, go sex first strike. on the sex strike. Oh my God. The ancient Greeks invented it, as you know, and. Um, Lysistrata, and I, I personally don't want to go on a sex strike, you know, <laughs> yeah. but, I, you know, it's hard enough at a certain age if you have a partner of a certain age to have sex anyway, uh, and I adore him. 30 years with my fourth husband, fourth and last yeah, husband. fourth is the charm, it turns yeah, out. Yeah, fourth is the charm. But, I really do think that the sex strike is a kind of primitive way of dealing with men. Better educate your sons than go on a sex strike. Well, the idea there, and but I- But it's a wonderful idea. Well, and I don't think it's a wonderful idea, but it, I mean, I, it, the idea here is largely because of this heartbeat bill and, and, and Georgia is become, because of Brian Kemp, like, you know, Handmaid's Tale. Um, or he's trying, anyway, to make it Handmaid's Tale. Um, she does a lot of good stuff, Alyssa Milano, like a lot of very good stuff. She like drives people to polls. She, you know, it's a complicated situation. I, I don't know that not having sex with your Democratic husband, you know, <laughs> is going to be like a lot of us who are would be on this strike are married to men who pretty much agree with us. So I'm not right. sure where this goes. I also think like the larger issue of withholding sex to get power. I mean, there's a lot of, you know, there's, you're getting into some really dangerous territory here about feminism and the human body and representation. And I, I mean, it, it wouldn't be my first choice on how to go with this. Um, and the other thing is that largely, like, we need to, we need to boycott Georgia. Like, that's the issue here, is boycotting Georgia until Brian Kemp realizes that if he makes draconian laws, people aren't going to go to his state. Like, Republicans are all about states' rights. OK, great. Yeah, let's We won't go it. to your state. I, so I saw on MSNBC today, by the way, that the, a lot of uh, movie companies are not going to make movies in Georgia. Right. But they should all not. They should all not. And, and we need corporate power to back us up. I mean, it's... And court, we gave them so much money in the tax break, they should but it's back us up. It, but it's interesting to me, and it shows how morally abhorrent our government is, that corporations have to be the moral backbone right. of our exactly. country. Like, is a pretty sad testament. So, but I do think we have to look to them for something. I mean, the Chobani yogurt guy, you know, has been, like, a real leader. There are places where corporations have done the right thing, and, like, it's pathetic that we need to beg them to do this because if yes, we had a normal is. government, we wouldn't, but I agree. Right. So I hope we answered that. Okay, I got it. Hi. Yeah. <laughs> Hello. Hi, good to see you both and thank you. I wanna take a turn and just talk about pleasure and mm -hmm. sex. Yes. <laughs> um, and a large part of what I do is have conversations about sex, sexuality, and spirituality. And so Erica, I'd love for you to talk about, especially when Fear of Flying first came out and all the backlash, what was it either within your own emotional life, your own psyche that allowed you to keep going and keep on persisting with being a woman who is not going to shut up in the world. For those of us who are still like hitting, you know, those of us who are still hitting up against uh, challenges, and 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 I have I'm dealing with this with a book that I'm have coming out. So great. That's why I wanted to bring it up. But you know, um, I lived through an age where censorship withered 
for the first time when I was in graduate school, you could read Lady Chatterley's Lover in a, in a cheap paperback for 95 cents. You could read um, Memoirs of a Woman of Pleasure or Fanny Hill. They were in the locked book room at Butler Library when I started at Barnard. And suddenly, we were reading all these great classics that were full of sex. And male writers responded by writing Portnoy's Complaint and Couples. And I was reading all these books, and I, I was thinking, but a woman has to say how she responded. Women have to affirm pleasure. And that's why I wrote Fear of Flying. And my aim always was to write the books for women that don't yet exist. My favorite novel is Fanny being the true history of the adventures of Fanny Hackabout Jones, which Julie Taymor and I are making into a miniseries. It's about a female Tom Jones. It's a book of mine that was always beloved, but never sold 37 million copies, like Fear of Flying. But all my books are attempt to be the books for women that don't yet exist. Can can you yeah. talk about the NRA, the NEA grant? What <laughs> happened? This is like a fun controversy, I feel like. Well, when I was a young poet, I won an NEA grant. To the National Endowment for the Arts. National Endowment for the Arts. And there was a whole argument in Congress about why they were funding dirty books. <laughs> I had won it for my first two books of poetry, not Fear of Flying didn't exist yet. But congressmen were yelling at each other and saying, you're funding dirty books. Because when Fear of Flying came out, I had written a little note in the back saying, and thank you to the NEA, you know, because you, I should never have done that. Um, but because you try to thank the people who helped you. So you can look that up. It's in the congressional record. It is so funny and stupid, you wouldn't believe it. <laughs> There's a hand up here. Hi there. So I remember somehow getting my little pause on your book, A Fear of Flying, <laughs> like when I was kind of a kid. Like I'm sure I was under 20. <laughs> and um, I remember having it, and it was like I had it in my family home, and I would like hide it so my mom <laughs> like couldn't see it. And um, I so I really appreciate you being here today, but... Can you just, one, tell us the reason why you wrote it and maybe even tell a, just a little brief history for some, because I know there's people here who are younger than me who maybe don't even know, like, why, like, what it is. Like, can you just give us, like, a little brief history yes. about it, please? I thought... And how'd you decide to write it, too? That's what I want to know, too. Well, suddenly censorship doors had opened, and the men were writing books about their Columbia. pleasure. You were at Columbia at the time. Yeah. And, and I thought, well, where's the woman's point of view? We've got to have the woman's point of view. And that really motivated me to write it. And when I wrote it, I, I didn't believe it would ever be published. I say this 37 million copies later. It's in Arabic. It's in Mandarin. It's published but you all were, over you were the in world. graduate school when you wrote it, When right? I started writing, yes. And then I finished it, and it was pub I, I spent the whole of my 20s, writing it and also writing poetry. And um, did you send it to an editor? Can you just tell us, tell us like the real story of like the book, you wrote it, you sat down, you wrote it from when to when, how old were you, and then who'd you send I it to? I started it in my 20s, and I worked on it throughout my, my 20s. And I remember I had given a novel to my publisher. Aaron. So who was your agent? You had an agent? I didn't have an agent. <laughs> No agent wanted me. Are you kidding? OK, good. OK. I mean, people think you were always successful, but no. OK. I remember I had a wonderful aid, uh, editor who had published my fir first two books of poetry, Fruits and Vegetables and Half-Lives. And he said, but surely, Erica, there must be a novel. So I gave him the novel. I had also been gestating, because I'm always working on 10 things at once. And it was called The Man Who Murdered Poets. And it was kind of an homage to Nabokov. And he read it, Aaron read it, and he said, beautifully written, I won't publish it. And I said, if it's beautifully written, why won't you publish it? He said, go home 
and write a novel in the voice of those amazing poems. Why are you writing in a man's voice? Because my first novel was written in a man's voice. He said, I said, because all the books that are praised are in a man's voice. He said, that's why you should not do it. And I tabled that Sorry. book and started yeah. fear of flying. I and mean, the editors then were different. And then you wrote it, wait, just tell us, so they wrote the whole thing. Yeah. And then you gave it to him and he published it. Yes. But, okay, I thought he, Elaine Coster, there were other people. No, Elaine Coster was my paperback editor. Okay. Aaron published it and he said, well, it will only sell 35,000 co 35, copies. I'm not printing anymore. It's very literary. Okay. <laughs> and the most famous agent at that time, Lynn Nesbitt, didn't want to take it because she said, it will never sell, right? So I gave it to Aaron, and he published it. And for the first time, there was a woman editor at New American Library, now Penguin. And she called up Aaron, and she said, this book is the story of my life. And if you don't print 100,000 copies, I'm not buying the paperback rights. <laughs> the world had changed. So Elaine became the paperback editor, and she printed hundreds of reading copies and sent it to everyone. And that was only because a woman was the head of a company. Right. So that's the way these things grow. Amazing. Um, I'm that gonna, was Elaine. I'm going to, I'm getting, I'm getting what? welling up, Mom. <laughs> You're welling up. Yeah, welling up. Well, but we're still not there. Yeah. And we still don't have a woman president. And we've seen the way Hillary was slandered for 30 years and the way she won the popular vote mm -hmm. and the way she didn't get to be president because uh, of interference in the election. Okay, more questions. Yes. More questions? Yes. Hi. That was really a depressing situation. <laughs> Hello. Hello. That's what I sound like. Um, there have been amazing topics spoken about, but the one thing you said earlier on was... Uh, a little writing, louder. Oh, sorry. I'm, it's my first time. Uh, how writing is like an open wound, and I, it's a two-part question. Does that wound ever heal, and how do you use your platform to build on that? Yeah, good question. What you you go first. It's your quote. How do it's I use quote. my platform? Talk, okay, I'm going to say it louder because you couldn't hear him, could you? Yeah. Open, the, was about that open wound quote. Can you yes. talk about that? How is writing like an open wound? And does it ever heal? It never heals. <laughs> um, you become an instrument for everything in the world that's wonderful and terrible. And if you can't deal with that, don't be a writer. I, I mean it. And I love encouraging young writers. And I'm getting well known for doing that because I care a lot. And I do teach writing from time to time. But you have to be an instrument, and all the winds play on you. You used to always say to me what, about writing that you need to go to the typewriter and open a vein. There's a, I think there's a Nabokov quote about that, no, too. It's, not, it's, it's um, somebody. Mailer. It's, I don't know who said it. The yeah, Many people have said, go to a typewriter and open a vein. Yeah. I always write on yellow legal pa uh, pads because I feel the hand-heart connection. I like that. But um, I think, I don't know, I, I think you can still have a, I don't think you have to be a tortured artist. Like, I think you can, you know, especially in this world, I think there's room for both. I, I always, I never thought, there, there are some great writers who have very untortured lives. Like, Steve King is a really good, prolific writer who does really smart stuff. Who's, Steve is... Who Amazing. has very, who doesn't have a torture. You, know, I think you there's knew him when you for, were a little girl. But I think there's room for lots of different writers. I don't but think I think is Steve tortured. is plenty tortured. Well, I don't Are know. But I'm just, <laughs> I think, anyway. Look at this fantasy line. All right, Jesus. Okay. okay. Uh, so we're good and non-controversial here. Yay. Right. Owen, oh, write to me later. <laughs> what? This kid is going to write to no, me later. No, oh. look. Anyway, just kidding. Um, but yes, no. I don't mean that life is no fun or that, you don't, that you're always, you know, sort of moaning. I don't mean that at no, all. No, I know. I, I just mean that you're sensitive 
to the changes happening. Right. And I which you are too. Well, and that quote from 2004 was pretty amazing that yeah. you saw that all coming. We have more questions? Back, well, in the same vein of supporting young people and especially women supporting each other and, and mentoring, um, how do you approach that relationship and how do we ensure that the women and the young people we are mentoring will make that um, continue and, and continue building that culture. Um, I am also a writer, my veins are always open, and I think it's something that you learn to navigate as a creative and you know learn how to work with those winds and those energies. Um, and that's something that I feel responsible to pass on, especially because I've never had a female uh, professional mentor. You know, I had mentors as a Mm -hmm. very, very young writer in, in high school and before that. But I think once you reach a certain age as a woman and enter professional fields, the landscape changes quite a bit. It does. I, I, I also have to say that America has this horrible history of Puritanism. And that lingers in a way. And it also has a horrible history of racism, which lingers, and anti-Semitism. But I, which lingers, with, and you have to stand up and speak against those things because they're still in our culture. But I think that um, when we're talking about mentoring, you know, it's this idea of, of trying to bring a level of selflessness. You know, I mean, I see this with the activism stuff. You know, these women, these Arizona, in Arizona, I was in Arizona, and Sheriff Joe Oparo had. Um, you know, ran can concentration camps in Arizona and killed lots of people. And or not lots of people, but people died in horrible ways in these jails. And it gave birth to this new generation of activists who are incredible because they saw, and there was also this very discriminatory bill in Arizona, this anti-immigrant bill where you could fire someone for being an immigrant. So it gave birth to these young activists who became these incredible figures, and you're going to see a lot. You're going to see a lot of these activists everywhere. And because um, I heard them, and they're just incredible. And so I think it is this idea of, like, we are here to give back. Like, we are here to be of service. Like, ultimately, at the end of the day, like, we are put on this earth to, like, be able to, I mean, that's how I feel anyway. As I've gotten older, I don't know why. It's weird. But, yeah. like, um, but these girls, like, have just devoted their lives to giving back because of what happened to their relatives or, their, or what they saw happen. And so I do think that that's how we do it, is this idea of like giving back. I mean, when people write to me on Twitter, which they do a lot, um, I try to always write back. And I try to always be um, incredibly like open and as and helpful minded. as, well, no, just as helpful as possible. I mean, if somebody's going to send me a death threat, I'm not going to write back, but um, except sometimes. But, um, <laughs> uh, it, you know, there's this opportunity, I think, and I think this is this idea of national service. You know, there's this opportunity to really engage with people and to really help them. And I think, you know, you hear someone like Beto when he was running in Texas, like, talk about this idea, like, we are here to be of service, like, public service. And um, so I think the more we have that attitude, the more we can support other women and they can support us. And we can, you know, and we can be part of this larger you know, tapestry. I mean, Obama talked so much about this. This was like Obama's message, hope, like that we can like lift each other up. And I think we have to come back to come back to that. And like what Trumpism as we've seen is that like in the end, like the American people don't really want this sort of cynical, everyone out for themselves world. Like we Kleptocracy. really Right. We really want to support each other. So I do think like if the midterms have shown us anything, it's that we can support each other. But really, it's a battle, I will say. And I think if you're a writer, you're also trying to be of service to other human beings. To I mean, I was so lucky in my life. I got to be friends with Maya Angelou. I got to be friends with Lillian Hellman. I mean, Henry Miller, for God's sake. Um, people who sort of adopted me. It was amazing. My life has been so lucky. But what connects all these people was they really believed that an artist gives service, that an artist is an awakener. 
and a politician as well. All right. Uh, hey, just so you guys know, I slid into Molly's DMs to say, do you want to do this? And she said, absolutely. We we're talking on the phone 10 minutes later. Um, you mentioned corporate responsibility in terms of changing the culture. You mentioned representation in terms of changing the culture and, and uh, artists supporting artists. Um, speaking on behalf of, of Playboy here, and I know that, that, that I have a privilege to do that, um, I want to hear from Erica and from Molly in terms of I, being a woman, in terms of my female writers, my female editors, being a woman who is pro Playboy um, yeah. can be contentious. And um, uh, y both of you have been support supporters of the, of the brand or, um, for quite some time. Uh, can you tell me? Uh, or, or some, you know, anybody, what is Playboy's role? What is Playboy's responsibility? Erica, based on what it was in the 70s yeah. and, and when, what you were dealing with, and then Molly, t today, in, in terms of how I can tweet you and you say absolutely yes, um, in terms yeah. of a, a representation and corporate responsibility point of view. Well, you know, I think we have to stand up for women's desire, which doesn't mean we want to be doormats. Um, we have bodies, we have desire. And I think that the old pl Playboy tried to present that picture, but it was a little bit early. Um, and it got confused with nude women somehow. And it got confused with other ideas that um, the founder of Playboy had. I have to admit, I never went to the Playboy mansion. Uh, it, wasn't, it wasn't my emotional desire. But I really like the idea that women want to have pleasure and that we have bodies and that pleasure is part of our lives. In that, I agreed. See, it, and you can be a feminist and also want to have pleasure, for see, God's sake. It's funny because when Shane called me, I was like, I, I always thought of Playboy as like publishing John Updike and like this literary legacy. So I was like, sure. I was like, why not? You know, and I also am not an anti-sex feminist. I mean, I actually think that our side has been pretty good about not being anti-sex. Our side, I mean Democrats. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> but you know what I mean? Or people who, you know, that feminists have, we've, we ha we're more, you know, I think, I, I, I did not associate Playboy with anything negative, you know, and I, and there's like this incredible liter literary legacy and these endless interviews, so I was thrilled. I mean, I think it's very smart, and also the other thing is like, there is a, we need to be talking about all of this stuff. Like, if yeah. we're not talking about sex, we are not talking, you know, like, they take, they want to take away abortion and they want to take away sex education, and there's a reason because they don't want people, it's not, they don't want to prevent abortions. They just want to, you know, take it all away. Right. And um, so I think the more we talk about sex, the more we talk about birth control, the more we talk about all of this is good. So I was thrilled. Well, the, but a way of torturing people and getting your point of view of cro across is ending free sexuality. That's what dictators always do. You know, they take away birth control and they make you wear stupid hats. But the other And before thing, you know it, you're in a Margaret Atwood novel. But the other <laughs> But the other thing is that if you're not going to do sex education, it's not like people are going to stop having sex. It's just No, they that never will stop. Are going to stop being safe. And right. that's a larger issue. I mean, right. it's just like with abortion. It's when when And healthcare. Right. But And we, women, you know, when Molly was 14 years old, she went to a doctor. Oh, great. I waited. I'm, waiting I'm excited around. that we got this story oh, in never there. Mind. Yay. Right, so and, but no, every, no, I can't wait. Please, every girl details. Have that. Please, details. That's all. No, you sure? You don't want to I get more into there. it? I wasn't there. Sure. Birth control at 14? I, I, didn't, I personally, yeah. Well, anyway. <laughs> this is a I'm wonderful sorry story. I said this. I knew I would stumble at some point. <laughs> Oh, no. She's great. Mom. It's Mother's Day. Yes, happy Mother's Day. <laughs> we don't agree on everything, by the way. Yes. yes. I just want to encourage everyone. I do not work with Playboy, FYI, but there's an amazing docuseries on Amazon about um, Playboy and its history. And one of the things I just that always that struck me is that they were very instrumental in funding um, civil rights. Yes. Mm -hmm. And also women and feminist movements. 
so please watch this documentary, learn a little bit more about the brand, and because this all of this makes sense when you know the history. Right. Yeah. Right. It's very thank cool. You for this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So on, on that note, that's all we have time for for today. Okay. Is there anything you wanted to? Uh, did, I feel like there's one. Can we take one last question? Is that okay? okay. We'll talk really Let's fast, we promise. Go for it. <laughs> okay, here we go. Um, I feel like there's so many different definitions of feminism, and I would really love to hear yours. Good question. You want to go yours? first? You tell me. Mine is very simple, and I learned it from my mom, though she may not remember telling me this. Equal rights for women. Equal rights. Like that's why when women say I'm not a feminist, you don't believe you are equal to men because I believe I'm equal to men. Like I should be paid the same. I should, you know, equal rights. Like we don't need, you know, this is not like rocket science. We want to be treated equally, you know. That's, you know, she summed it up. That's what I believe in. We should have equal rights in writing. We should have equal rights in pay. We should have equal rights in medicine. Our bodies are different, but we should not have to go scrounging to um, people for an abortion, for God's sake. I had friends when I was in high school who died from abortions, yeah. um, who went to New Jersey. New Jer they always went to New Jersey yeah. for the abortion. <laughs> Women should be able, their bodies should be safe as safe as medical technology can make it. And anyone who takes that away is an enemy of women. All right. yeah. And men, by the way. Thank because, you. you know, we have, we have genders. Um, thank you guys for coming. Thank you so much. Happy Mother's Day. Oh.